Um, we've got a couple of minutes here before we start with uh, Dr. Berg's presentation on the medical management of dental caries. Uh, just some housekeeping items. Uh, if you have questions in your Zoom um, uh, panel there, you'll have down below where it says Q&A. Please type your questions in there and uh, we'll be giving uh, Dr. Berg a heads up as we uh, uh, as he's presenting and uh, stopping them when it's appropriate to maybe uh, slide some of those questions in. We'd like to thank all our sponsors. Uh, we've got sponsors everywhere from uh, Comet USA, uh, Seattle King County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, University of Washington School of Dentistry Continuing Education, and I think that about covers it. What you're seeing right now is a slide deck that's rotating through on some of our upcoming webinars. Uh, we've got some great speakers lined up. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Berg uh, today. We've got Dr. Lane Ochi on Tuesday next week, uh, Dr. Jason Kim on Thursday next week. And we're gonna continue with this webinar series over the next uh, four, five, six weeks. Uh, so you'll see uh, more and more uh, emails from us uh, look for this kind of blue background because that will give you a heads up that uh, there's a webinar that we'll be presenting. If you want to register for one of those um, upcoming uh, webinars, uh, as the slide deck's going through, you'll see there's QR codes. I'm going to stop here right for a second. Uh, your CD certification is going to be emailed to you uh, if you've registered after the presentation, okay? You're also going to get a survey from the University of Washington. AGD members, you do not need to submit your CE. We will do that for you. Um, also, this isn't a quick process. We're, we've got um, recordings of the webinar from this morning and of this one this afternoon. It's going to take us a little bit of time to get that online. So please do not call, do not email asking us where the copy of that pre of the presentations are. Um, speaking of the webinar this morning, uh, one of our uh, panelists uh, misspoke. Uh, we don't know of any uh, extension in Oregon of the mandated time dentists have to be out of their office. So uh, I think uh, he was trying to say there was a rumor going around there and uh, kind of misspoke. So uh, there's no updated information as far as we know. Um, one other thing, we have a Crown Preparation 101 course that we've moved from May to August. This course is really focused uh, for young clinicians and dental students. Uh, we're not sure yet if we're gonna be holding that course at the University of Washington or at the Washington AGD uh, Educational Center, but uh, we'll have a little better idea here once we get back up rolling and the University of Washington gets rolling. So we'll see if there's space to accommodate us there. Um, I think that covers everything uh, regarding the upcoming webinars. Um, when you're using this Zoom um, uh, format, you want to be in speaker view, not gallery view. If you're in gallery view, you're not going to be able to see uh, Dr. Berg's uh, presentation. So uh, play around with it a little bit um, and you should be able to navigate to that. So Looks like we're right on uh, at 2.30 here. I'm just gonna let this slide deck rotate through one more time and then we're gonna bring Dr. Berg in and uh, get rolling uh, with this presentation. So thanks again to all our sponsors. Thanks to everybody out there that is joining us. And uh, we uh, look forward to seeing you Friday morning for our Omni Practice Group. Uh, leadership through crisis. This is the uh, the second one in the series that they're doing for the Washington AGD. Please, you can share these links with any of your colleagues out there. Anybody is welcome to attend these CE uh, events. We have room for up to a thousand. This morning we had 860 some people on that presentation. I think we've got about 400 registered for this one, so we can handle some more. Um, if you have a speaker that you would like us to contact, 
to uh, do a presentation for us, please let us know. Uh, Dr. Ricardo Matrani agreed to do a presentation for us. We've got Dr. Kevin Quechen, uh, we've got Dr. Keith Phillips, and a whole host of others uh, lined up to uh, provide CE over the next uh, five, six weeks. So, that slide deck's gone through uh, one more time. At the end of Dr. Berg's presentation, we'll throw this back up just in case you want to hit one of the QR codes uh, to uh, get yourself registered for one of the upcoming webinars. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing mine and uh, let's, all righty. And Dr. Dr. Berg, I think you should be able to share your uh, desktop now. Yes, I'm all set. Does everybody see it? Look good on this side here. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Hess, very much. And thank you to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry and Valerie for organizing this. I'm, I'm honored to be here. I'm going to get going. Uh, I um, just want to say that I'm thinking of all my colleagues and friends, mainly in, Wa in Washington State and everywhere. Uh, who are here. I'm currently in uh, Glendale, Arizona, but this shows that we are one world of dentistry everywhere and uh, working together through this as we do each day. So I'm talking about my favorite subject, which is medical management of dental caries. And uh, for many years, I've been talking about this, and I think it's probably as important, if not more important than ever, that we have this as the subject. And in this sh relatively short uh, program, this webinar today, I'm going to give you an overview of what that means, what is medical management of caries, and what are the elements of it, and why I think it's so important. So my sort of educational objectives would be that you would agree with me that it's uh, okay. Before I go on, I have to tell my Washington friends that I'm wearing my Legion of Boom uh, Seahawks championship sweatshirt from a couple of years ago, and it just reminds us... Uh, um, of, of the times that were, of the past that were great that we'll find ahead. So uh, let's move forward. These are the topics I want to cover today. This is normally an all day course, and, but I want to give you the basics of this because it's so important right now. Uh, there are many people as, we, as you have other conversations about re-emerging into practice that people have talked about it when you follow the chats that it's going to go in phases and that's probably accurate. We're in phase one now where we're treating emergencies only. Phase two will be maybe that we do some procedures that don't necessarily generate a lot of aerosols or we haven't finally worked out whatever the in intensified uh, infection control protocols are gonna be. Just like after HIV, I was treating patients back then and uh, we had the same feeling. It's, it, it feels very similar to me in the sense that at the time we didn't know uh, what it was gonna mean. And what we do know is it's gonna get worked out. But in phase two, there's a lot of medical management we can do then and very soon thereafter we'll be back business as usual. So I'm going to talk today about the history of dental practice related to caries, medical management. What is it? What is medical management of caries? Why do we do it? A little bit about caries risk assessment versus caries lesion detection. There are so many exciting technologies evolving in this area. This is one of the key areas that has to evolve, that is evolving and will evolve further that will allow us to change some of the basic ways in which we all practice dentistry. Um, and then the treatments, the restorative philosophy in the future. Um, before I get started, I want to just also add that I'm, in case for those who don't know, I'm Professor Emeritus of the University of Washington. I still teach uh, online, uh, not just now, but in the past to the uh, residents in pediatric dentistry. I work uh, half my time for a startup venture in oral health, and I practice in a private practice in, in pediatric dentistry. So I'm active in practice myself, as I always have been. So here are what I think the biggest trends in the profession are as a whole. The biggest is consolidation, and of course, we're going to keep hearing more about large group practices, DSOs, whatever we call them, uh, individuals forming groups with their peers. This is where most of the money is being invested in dentistry. So that's a reality that will probably continue and perhaps at an accelerated rate. Another big trend, and I'm not talking about any of these today, but I want to put them in context of today's conversation, is big data. And we don't have a lot yet with big data, but I can tell you for sure in medicine, it's become really important artificial intelligence. Imagine if you're sitting at the chair and I'm a pediatric dentist, I'll use me as an example. I've got an eight-year-old and I see an interproximal lesion. I don't know whether I'm gonna do, based on various conditions, a stainless steel crown or maybe a zirconia, we have these prefab zirconia crowns, or a, an intracoronal resin composite restoration. 
or maybe a glass ionomer. Well, I can go to a database perhaps where I can look at thousands of cases where, where providers like me have had the same dilemma with the same conditions of a patient and it'll report on the outcomes of what occurred based on having done it this way or that way. That's one of the things that big data can do and it's, it's really highly loaded with high level evidence. So we'll see more of that. The other thing that we talk about a lot, of course, is the whole payer system. You know, we've been sort of um, compelled to live within a certain way of getting reimbursed. And one of the issues of, of one of the challenges of getting more medical management of carries is the compensation system for providers is not set up so that we can get properly compensated for doing what would be the right thing in some situations. So if providing the right services, the compensation isn't there, you know. Uh, that it is true in some areas of dentistry, like in oral medicine or in uh, oral surgery somewhat, but in the rest of dentistry, which is primarily restorative, we don't get that kind of uh, reimbursement. That's all going to have to change to our mutual benefit of our patients and us. Uh, but medical management of caries, I'm going to think, I'm going to say is going to be one of the biggest trends, if not the trend that will take over dentistry. And I will explain that to you. So here's a chart that I published a couple of years ago that kind of explains my take and what medical management of caries means. I call it the caries management continuum. So if you look at the far right to start, and I think, can you, you see my, Dr. Hess, you can see my pointer, is that right? Yes, that's and, correct. So yep. um, traditional operative dentistry. So I'm talking to Dr. Hess, a, a highly skilled operative dentist. <laughs> uh, we, we, we as dentists, as a, as a community, we, we treat most of dental caries as the result of dental caries. So dental caries is a process, it's a disease process. And the result of that disease process is destruction of the tooth in some way. And then we repair that destruction with restorative dentistry, operative dentistry, fixed pros, whatever it may be. That's repairing destruction from the disease dental caries. So in that instance, which is most of how we manage it, it's not our fault, we have had no choice. We, ha we can't see it usually until it gets pretty advanced. Uh, at that stage, we're not actually treating the disease anymore. <clears throat> Yet every lesion that we see that's destroyed the tooth and requires restorative intervention started as a lesion that we couldn't see along the way. So along the way, there are levels of invasivity. How invasive is the procedure we're doing? So if you imagine we were perfectly able to control the microbiome, you know, the biofilm, and we'll talk about that briefly today, we could actually do some things that would actually prevent this process, this cascade of events from ever occurring. There's a lot we don't know about saliva. Uh, there's so much to talk about in each of these, but I think you get my, my drift here. Remineralization, we all believe in it, but we can't see it clinically as well as we'd like. We don't have the sensitive detection methods. That's changing. Some of you may deploy a technique called resin infiltration, a product called ICON in your office, which is a really nice way of dealing with smooth surface lesions before they're cavitated. That's something, by the way, that in this interim phase two, where if you're, you know, if we're reluctant or aren't able to use aerosol generating devices like hand pieces, that you could actually do something. Some of these things can be done uh, in the office to treat early caries lesions short of uh, restorative intervention. Silver diamine flora, we all know about that. I'll talk briefly about that. That's going to get a lot more attention as, long, as well as other agents that will evolve in order to treat caries as a disease. Uh, minimally invasive restorative, of course, is less invasive than traditional operative or defect specific. So everything to the right of where I'm pointing involves a burr cutting. Everything to the left does not. So, you know, we can kind of separate those kinds of procedures into those that it's interventions of caries that are the disease only without restoration and those that are some restorative aspect. And by the way, you know, I, I'm not declaring the end of restorative dentistry by any means. We're all going to be doing a lot of restorative dentistry for eternity, likely. Uh, yet, uh, we're going to have a bigger mix of other methods of treating the disease dental caries. Uh, I used to give talks to the medical students about dentistry. And, you know, physicians don't get much on dentistry. They get about, uh, well, I'm only showing you two or three of the seven slides they get in the four years of medical school. <laughs> approximately. And UW is ahead of the game. They get more there than most medical schools, but they look at it as disease. You know, they get the morphology, they get the, you know, the, the morphology of the teeth. They, they learn about the structure, the, the different structures in the mouth. And then they get some, can, they get some disorders of the oral cavity. So to physicians, it's all about diseases, you know, birth defects, dental caries, gingivitis, erostomia, erosion, cancer. 
and they get these as diseases. So they're not, you know, to, to physicians, they're not hearing about the restorative part as we focus a lot of attention on appropriately. They're getting the disease part. So, so we are the ones who are, it's in our hands to manage this disease. I like to start this talk when I give the longer version. And for those who've heard me speak, you know the answer to this. Um, what, you know, 20 years ago was the turn of the millennium and everybody thought the world was gonna come to an end then because there weren't enough zero decimal places in the computers, but we all survived that and we'll survive this too. And um, they asked the scientists back then, you know, what were the biggest events of the millennium? What changed the world more than anything else in the previous 1000 years? They asked historians and scientists and technologists and, um, you know, they, they got together, you can find this online and give you an example, the 13th most significant event of the 1000 years of the whole millennium was the vaccination. We're talking about vaccinations now, how important they were to mankind. That was the 13th most significant event. It was invented in 1796, surgery without pain, anesthesia, invented by a dentist in Boston, as you likely know. And that was in uh, 1846, that was the 93rd most significant event in terms of its impact on humankind over a 1,000 year period. But the most significant event was the invention of the printing press. That impacted the world more than anything else by far. Everybody agreed on that. What was fascinating to me when I read this was that happened in the first half of the millennium in 1455. That means that everything that happened after that was deemed less significant. So we tend to think that things that happen close to our lifetime are more meaningful, more significant, yet this says otherwise. So I started thinking about dentistry, you know, what, what are the big changes in our profession? What's the most significant thing that's happened in the last hundred years in dentistry? And what's gonna be the most significant thing in our profession going forward? And this kind of event that we're all undergoing right now makes us think about that from a broader perspective. So I'll come back to that. Um, having said that, in 2006 and 14 years ago, there's a publication called Science News. I read it, it comes out weekly. At the end of the year, they have a special issue that talks about the top science of the year. And in the 2006 issue, at the end, they had this picture of a tooth, and I was thinking, what could be so important about a tooth that makes it to the top science stories of the year? And they said that a prehistoric village in Pakistan, found there they found the oldest examples of dental work. 11 teeth with drilled holes dating back 9,000 years. So I'm looking at this and thinking, isn't that what we do today? You know, we wait for the disease to manifest itself. The, the, the roof is on fire, it's leaking or it's burning, and then we repair it. So I'm, it's not our fault, it's just that we haven't been able to see it or manage it prior to that. So really, you know, the nine, we have it better. We have materials that are better. We have anesthesia, we have all these things, but they were actually doing restorative cutting teeth. In fact, I have a team looking at this. We think that's a 330 burr. Not quite sure yet. We'll work that out later. Um, and then as you may have seen, you know, later on in 2012, a lot of this stuff comes from, you know, this is from Forbes. It was published in ADA News. They found the oldest, what they call fillings for cavities. And this was 6,500 years old in Slovenia. They, they have uh, used beeswax to restore teeth. So again, is that really conceptually that different? We have better materials. We have anesthesia. We have rubber dams. I don't know, maybe they had rubber dams. Uh, good cable surface margin, Dr. Hess, I think. I think we could uh, pass that one on the, I can't see the 3D you know, contour, but uh, I don't know if it would make it in the Tucker Study Club or not, but, uh, but uh, not bad for 6,500 years ago. And then you may have seen later on in the ADA news, they found some jaws from 14,000 years ago, 14,000 year old cavity prep. Now, they must have been doing composite, not uh, amalgam, because they didn't do extension for prevention. However, I mean, the fact that they were cutting teeth 14,000 years ago is pretty phenomenal. You, know, you like to wonder what they did. But I'm just saying all this just to show, you know, that um, conceptually at a high level, we're still waiting for the results of the disease, not treating the disease. So I've asked audiences to tell me over the years of giving this talk, what are the most significant events of the 100 years in dentistry? And this is the list I get, anesthesia, that's local anesthesia, high-speed handpiece, fluoride, acid etch technique, light polymerization, CAD CAM, and some have said implants that should be on that list. Now, if you look at that list, and they all make sense as some of the most impactful things in our profession, every one of them except fluoride has to do with restorative dentistry, right? So it's all restorative. So the innovations in our profession, and again, you think about the printing press was the most significant thing in a thousand years to the world, and it happened in the first 500 years of that millennium. So think about dentistry, looking back 100 years from now or 50 years from now, 
what's going to be the biggest thing as science evolves, I think it's going to be treatment of caries as a disease. That we're going to look back and say, we finally are able with the advances in science, not only wait for the tooth to need restorative dentistry, but earlier we can start to manage the disease and take care of it and nip it in the bud before it becomes a destruction of the tooth. Now, Miller, who was the first dental microbiologist to work in the lab of Robert Koch, who was uh, the famous you know, Koch's postulates in Germany for bacterial transmission of disease, gave a, a definition of uh, caries. And I'm not going to read this, but if you look through this and you'll have a copy of this presentation, you can see that the definition we have today, the Academy of Pediatric Dentistry basically used the same definition recently. So it hasn't changed. We've known about the process of caries, but we treat it as if we can't see it because we can't. And even G.D. Black, who is the father of modern restorative dentistry, was saddened by the fact that he was compelled to restore teeth and wasn't able to deal with the biofilms. He did a lot of research on biofilms, you'll see. And Miller, this dental microbiologist, you know, he published some pivotal papers in the late 1800s, some principles that are still true today. And all this stuff that we talk about related to uh, you know, the mouth body connection. You know, it's a big deal that we talk about that the mouth is connected to the body, the you know, periodontal disease and preterm babies or heart disease and all these connections that we make, the evidence for which is some is stronger than others. Um, this was all theorized in 1891 by Miller. He talks about the mouth being the origin of all these systemic diseases. So you know, people have talked about these things, but we haven't had the science. So what hasn't been there is the science and the technology. But if you look at the way science technology is developing, in the next couple of years, it's all going to explode with uh, great things for our profession in terms of what we're going to be able to do that we couldn't do even a few years ago. And that's what I'm really excited about. I want to spend a minute talking about the dental marketplace and um, why this is such an important deal from, a, from an expense standpoint. So if you look at the dental consumption, this year may be a little different, but this is from last year. Uh, in the United States, the dental market, the gross domestic consumption of dentistry, if you will, this is based on dental codes, okay, and, and CDT codes, is about $120 billion total uh, consumption. Now, that cost pays 80% of that goes for dental services to providers. About 12% goes for consumer products, that's toothpaste, mouthwashes, toothbrushes, um, you know, um, Listerine, big brands like Listerine, Crest, Colgate are like billion dollar brands each. And professional products is only 8%. So we spend a lot of time thinking about saving money on our equipment and our instruments and other things. Um, that's only 8% of the total dental marketplace. Most of it is, as you would guess, is dental fees. Now, here's something interesting. I'm going to shift gears and talk about medicine, literally pharma pharmacy. Um, a buddy of mine is, is the dean of pharmacy at UW, and he and I had a lot of chats about these things. This is a list from a couple of years ago. It hasn't changed that much, uh, and I'll update this soon with current data. But the list of the cost of the most expensive drugs in dollars in the United States in terms of sales. So the number one selling drug in, 19, in 2017 was Abilify. It's a mood-altering drug, and that's per quarter. So we spent $6.4 billion dollars a year on that drug and that one pill. And let's take the second one as a better example, Nexium. I think we all know Nexium is a proton pump inhibitor for esophageal reflux, which is very common. It's now over the counter. It's no longer a prescription. I think it went over the counter that year. And uh, so we spent in the US over $6 billion on Nexium, and they call it the purple pill. They even have a website, thepurplepill.com. And if you think about the size of that, I just want to give perspective into dentistry and why I think things are going to change. The largest dental manufacturer is Dentsply Serona. And I believe their sales last year, collectively, all the equipment, all the things, you know, all the great things they make, uh, Dentsply Serona, and Cirac, I believe, is, is theirs, and you know, many, many things, consumables. Their total sales were like $5.8 So this pill, Nexium, outsold the entire Dentsply Serona pretty amazing. Now, what that says to me is I started asking, do we have any medicines for dentistry? If we're treating diseases, we should have medicines. They have esophageal reflux, and that's less common than uh, dental caries, right? So why don't we have drugs? Not that drugs are the cure-all end-all. So I started thinking about the mechanism. So Nexium is a pill. It treats esophageal reflux. You take the pill. It goes systemically. It localizes in the area where it's effective, which is the proximal stomach distal, du distal esophagus, and it stops the production of acid. 
Well, I'm thinking, isn't, isn't uh, caries an acid production process? Why couldn't we disrupt the biofilm and stop a biochemical process similarly in the biofilm? And, you know, the patient comes in and says, hey, doc, my, my caries is acting up. Well, here, I got this pill for it, your prescription, and it'll reduce acid production in your biofilm. That's not far off. And talking to some scientists, particularly at the UW, there's, some, there's a guy named Jeff McLean. I'll mention him in a minute. He's incredible. And there are many other people across the country. They're doing some really cutting edge things that are going to change things forever. Um, and I'm not saying drugs are the cure, but I'm saying the fact that we don't have drugs that are used to mitigate disease to a major extent, like in medicine shows, we're not medically managing, we're, we're doing surgical management because we've had no choice again. Now, if you look at the reason for the expenditure of the 120 billion in dentistry based on function, you can see the vast majority is dental caries. So it's about 75 plus billion dollars of CDT codes just on dental caries, the results of dental caries. So all risk, most restorative, most pros, uh, most endo is the results of dental caries, right? So we spend a fortune. So if you add in the medical costs of caries, which aren't included here, so the kids, you know, that go to the hospital, the adults that go to the hospital with cellulitis, that go to the EDs that spend millions of dollars, you know, right now we're doing everything in our power to keep patients from going to the emergency room, right? Because we want them to be freed up for COVID-19 patients. Well, prior to all this happening, you probably know that the number one or number two reason for ED visits across the country is usually dental. Patients go for toothaches because they don't have a doctor, they don't have a dental home, they have no place to go as they show up in the EDs. It costs society millions of dollars. So that gets included into the caries cost too, plus all the hospital GA and all that kind of stuff. So it's really about 130 to $150 billion disease. And if you start making a list of the most expensive diseases, you have heart disease, you have diabetes, you have lung disease, um, you have a lot of others that are cancer in the $250 billion range per year. Dental caries, and if you look at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the UW, where they providing a lot of current data, so I think it's the best source of data on COVID-19, an amazing thing that Chris Murray does there at the UW. Uh, you can see dental caries separately, if you drill down to all their databases, is either the fifth or sixth, I forget, most expensive disease in the world. So even though dentistry is only 4% of healthcare, the disease, dental caries, is a very expensive disease because it's most of dentistry is related to the results of dental caries. Most of what we do, most of what manufacturers make is treating the effects of caries, not the disease itself. So I often ask uh, audiences, um, you know, did you have a cavity as a child? And I say this to non-dental audiences because I want to get their attention, you know, and I show them this picture because they could even tell that this first primary molar has a distal lesion. And they laugh and they chuckle and they compare notes and, you know, they say, well, yeah, I had a cavity. I went to the dentist and I had a shot and they fixed it and it was kind of a nuisance. They don't they think, why are you making all this attention around cavities? And then I show them this picture of a patient that we saw in uh, Seattle, one of the most affluent places in the world, two and a half year old, they're gonna lose all of 20 teeth, their first dental visit, you can see all the pustules and, you know, this is a medical condition, right? So, you know, dental caries is a very, uh, you know, it's a very serious disease. I'm gonna take my sweatshirt off here for a minute. Uh, it's, a, it's a very serious condition and it uh, actually can risk your life. And it does sadly in many cases, and you know, it doesn't get reported, but the fact that even a single life uh, is lost, especially in children from dental caries is crazy when it's an entirely preventable disease. So we'll get into that more. Here's my poster child who was seen by uh, my predecessor at UW, Pete DeMoto, years and years ago, older and well now, but this patient was four and a half years old. It looks like trauma, doesn't it? But it's not trauma. It's dental caries in the form of cellulitis gets into the hospital as soon as he's, um, as soon as he's NPO enough, we'll have, uh, we'll have an eye incision and drainage under dental anesthesia done by the oral surgeons. We'll be hospitalized at least overnight if it's a lower tooth, might be in the ICU because of fear of airway infringement, all because of a preventable cavity in a baby tooth. This probably was tooth I or J. So and he didn't have the age one dental visit. So. I use pediatric dentistry as an example, but you can come up with any kind of adult example, same thing. We're dealing with the difference with dental caries, which is very expensive, as I just told you, it's preventable for the most part. So there's so much we can do in the early stages of it. Now, the earliest sign is the white spot lesion. So we need to tell our physician colleagues how to see plaque and how to see white spots. 
These are pictures that my colleague Travis Nelson collected. Uh, he's the chair of pediatric dentistry at UW. And these are all cases that were seen by family docs or pediatricians. Not that they aren't trained, they are trained, but you know, they, they're in a hurry, they gotta look at 42 things during well baby checkups. And the parent finally came in and said, hey, I think there's something wrong with my kid's teeth here. Uh, what do you think? You know, and these are all those kind of pictures and they're pretty advanced, <laughs> pretty advanced stages. And we see this all the time and it's not their fault, uh, yet we could do more on the training. Although I would say Washington has done a very good job on training. Uh, they tend to look right to the posterior pharyngeal wall, you know, because they just don't have time. So we need to do better ways of screening during the well baby checkups and other ways. And also we need to teach them to look on the lingual. Uh, early childhood caries first starts on the lingual of the maxillary incisors where the nipple is pressed between the tongue and the uh, lingual surface of the maxillary teeth. And that's why you first see the signs on the lingual surface. We need to teach our medical colleagues that. Here's a child that came to see me, chipped tooth just after it erupted and it's associated with the famous, uh, what I call coffee table injury. <laughs> Just as they're starting to uh, walk, stand up, they fall, they chip. I tell mom, no problem, we can smooth that. Probably don't need to, it's an enamel. But I'm glad you came in because now we can have a conversation and that's what we call the age one dental visit, which I'm not gonna talk about today. Another time if people are interested because we encourage all dentists general and pediatric to see kids by the first birthday. And I'd love to do a talk about what that looks like and how to make that work in your practice. It's a great practice builder. And uh, I just interviewed the president of the Academy of Pediatric Dentistry about this and we will invite the entire dental community. So if interested, I'd love to do a talk just on what can you do at an age one visit. It, it are a lot of billable procedures. It's one of the greatest values. I say there's no visit more important and you don't pick up a handpiece but you do some really valued things for the patient. It's all communication, anticipatory guidance. Talk about that another time. We need to teach parents to look for white spots. I love this picture. My friend Simon Lynn took this at the UW and it uh, shows the, the progression of white spots towards cavitation. Uh, this shows the progression. You know, Parents don't know, adults don't know, any patient doesn't really know that caries is a process. You know, They have to see it as a process like we do. We have to talk a little bit more about saliva you know, we always talk about saliva. I always say, who owns saliva? Well, the patient owns their own saliva, but we have to own it as a profession. And I urge everybody at each visit to just make two notes in the chart, particularly for your adult patients. Is the saliva thick or thin? That's, you know, the viscosity. And is it adequate or inadequate? Is there enough of it? What's the flow rate like? If you just make that note, then you can document as things change. So the patient starts to take medications, um, in a practice-based research network at the UW, it was published very clearly that if a patient, especially seniors, take two or more medications which could impair the salivary function like antihypertensives, um, some cholesterol-lowering drugs, or antipsychotics in particular, they can lower the salivary flow. If you take two or more of those, you could actually start getting more caries lesions. So we need to start documenting saliva. I started a Facebook page a few years back and Dr. Hess, who's very facile with these things, wants to help me, I'll, I'll open it up again. Um, and it's called Saliva is Your Friend. And I posted this and I read this to kids sometimes. They think I'm weird. You know, Every week I'll tell parents who complain their child is too much drooling, saliva is your friend. It's the body's natural cleaner, remineralizer and healer of the mouth and body. We should thank our saliva every day. I can't tell how many kids I say, we should thank our saliva and they, they embrace it. But it's about having a conversation about the disease. So I think, each visit, we should talk about you know, the viscosity and quantity of saliva on each patient. So let's shift gears now and briefly. Um, so Dr. Moving... Berg? Yes, please. Uh, we, have a, we have a question. Uh, uh, salivary substitutes out there. Uh, yeah. Do you have any that you like uh, for uh, our geriatric patients? Yeah, so I'm not the best person to ask that one. I know there are many that are out there from uh, <clears throat> a couple different companies, and, they do, and I know they work. The reason I'm not the expert is we don't need them in kids too much. You know, those kids usually don't have salivary deprivation, mm -hmm. except when they get early childhood caries, and that's another detail. <clears throat> so I would suggest you uh, go to uh, your expert pharmacists who talk to you, or maybe some of the oral medicine people, and they can give you that information on the specific products. They have some good people at UW, of course, who know that quite well. Thank you. Anything else right now? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, 
So risk assessment, this is a very complicated subject. I could spend all day on this, but I just wanna give you some kind of takeaways. Most risk assessment tools that we have, and let me explain first what risk assessment is and make sure we're on the same page. Risk assessment is, is what physicians do all the time. You know, they, you go in their office and they touch you and they palpate you and they um, ask you questions. They might draw some blood, do some labs, and then they say, okay, here's your results. You're okay here, you're okay here, but you're really at high risk for this disease, right? You're high risk for this disease. So you need to do this, this, and this, and you need to take this pill. Dentistry, because we haven't understood the risk factors as well, we kind of treat everybody the same. So we have to start differentiating patients into levels of risk. And there are many reasons for that, mostly for the benefit of the patient who's at high risk, we can lower their risk, but also for us so we can actually see them more often. So if a patient's at high risk for caries, that's very likely they're going to have one or more caries lesions next time. Why don't we wait six months for a checkup? We should see them maybe in two months and we should get compensated. So, you know, these are the things I'm not going to get into the third party payer stuff that gets kind of, you know, muddy. However, we need to be having those conversations that if a patient's at high risk and we want, we all agree, we want to reduce their risk of getting cavities, uh, which results in more costly restorative dentistry then we should be all together on seeing them more often and coaching them and getting compensated on our part to do the things to lower their risk. So most risk assessment tools we have today, unfortunately, are, are very sensitive at picking up caries, but they're not specific. That means too many false positives. We got to get that right because if there are too many false positives and if 25 or 30% of my patient population is high risk and all of a sudden I'm seeing everybody because they show up as high risk every two months, that's not going to fly. We got to spend more money and time on those that are really high risk. And that's the basis of this risk assessment. So that's something that's getting fine, that's getting fine tuned and it will get better. And then we'll all be better off. Uh, but the tools we have are not specific. As I said, I'm going to give you a couple examples. This is the caries assessment tool, part of it from the Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. It's a good tool. However, it's very sensitive. So it says here, for example, just look at one thing under clinical findings. It says if the child has an active white spot, one white spot even, then they're a high risk patient. Well, I can tell you, you know, if I see 50 kids a day for recalls, which is typical for a pediatric practice, I can't tell you very many of the kids that don't have one white spot, <laughs> small one. So it's it, because it's afraid of not picking up something, it's overly sensitive and not specific. The same thing with this one from Canberra. I think many of you have heard of the test out of UCSF, John Featherstone. Uh, great test, scientifically documented. It's probably the best thing in terms of evidence towards what it shows. And it's a wonderful conversation piece to actually talk about the elements of risk. Yet, it's probably overly sensitive as well and not specific enough. Additionally, if you look at just the number of, this is the child version, the zero to five, there's an adult version that has even more parts. And I ask my colleagues who practice adult dentistry, does your staff have time to go through a chart like this for every patient? So I think we need, and although it's scientifically sound and it's great for teaching and for understanding the elements of risk, I personally believe we need something, we need technology. We need technology to support us in looking at all these things for us and giving us information. I'll talk about that briefly. Here's an example of an old technology that's not available in the US, it's available in Japan. I heard about it when I came to the UW, Pete Demoto, my predecessor, working with some groups in Japan about it and uh, called Karyostat or CAT21. And I, I can't uh, listen or see the audience, but if you can read Japanese, anybody who's, who is a Japanese reader, you could see this. But it's a really primitive, old, but effective idea. It, would wor it works for kids and adults. So if somebody wants to start a business around this, the reason they haven't done this is the FDA requires two big expensive tests, which nobody's gonna do because it's a commoditized kind of product. I won't get into that now either. However, it's a basically just a tube of 20% sucrose liquid with a dye in it. And then you take a sample of the patient's plaque from the most posterior tooth. So if it's a kid or adult, you know, it could be first molar, second molar, whatever. And you take the plaque sample, you put it in here, two days in the incubator, no immediate gratification. It's like a lab test that you would get from your doctor from blood. And after the incubator, and I love these cartoons, the, the thing starts to change color according to how much acid does your plaque biofilm make when it's challenged with sugar. So you do a sucrose challenge in the tube, take the plaque, put it in the tube. And I don't care whether it's strep mutans, lactobacilli, whatever it is, do, does mine make acid? How much acid does it make? 
So, and then I can tell risk. And without getting into all the detail, and I love this, it says, Mr. Mutans goes poo-poo on your teeth. It's a great cartoon for the kids. That's true. Mr. Mutans is going poo-poo on your teeth. And um, that's where I need the help from the Japanese speakers. Was there any later they could comment? But I've been told that's what it is. The picture certainly shows that. But uh, we need to start educating people that, you know, this is in their control. We can see a process of caries. So uh, I'd like to get us to a world where the focus is moving towards risk assessment and reducing risk factors. This is how dentistry is changing. Historically, we only treated the results of disease, restorative dentistry. And that's still, for the most part, the way we've been. We've moved a lot into prevention. We're good. We're better at prevention than most disciplines. Water fluoridation, fluoride recommendations we do, uh, oral hygiene, diet recommendations. They're effective for some, but for most, they don't change much. But the main reason they're not that effective is we don't divide patients into risk groups. If I have a high risk group that I see quester in my patient population, and I say, you really have a problem, then I can really focus some aggressive interventions. I can see them more often. I can get compensated for seeing them more often. I can do more things. I can give them home care. I can write a prescription. Uh, maybe a new drug will be available and I can get them to a low risk level. It's kind of like, you know, I, I often say it's like, we know that high cholesterol is bad for you, but I can't tell you what your cholesterol level is. That's kind of where we've been in dentistry. You know, about 40 years ago, we knew the cholesterol at a high level and the lipids were bad for you, but we had no simple cheap way of taking your cholesterol level. Imagine that. That's kind of where we are in dentistry. What if there was some technology or test? It might not be, it's not going to be a blood test. It's going to be some kind of test of the biofilm or a technology that looks for early demineralization and says, this patient has got lights flashing here. The roof's going to be on fire with holes in the teeth in six months if we don't do something. That's what we're looking for. And I think there's a lot of exciting things on the horizon that are going to get us there. Caries is preventable, unlike many other conditions. It has a biofilm that's responsible, just like periodontal disease, but the difference is in periodontal disease, periodontal disease is sort of a host overreaction destructive process, right? The neutrophils are destroyed by request from P. gingivalis to proteases. The cysteine proteases it makes say, stop neutrophils and kill your own tissue. And we gladly comply. And that's periodontal disease. But caries, if you think about it, we all demineralize our teeth microscopically whenever we eat sugar, but they remineralize and become stronger because remineralization, it works better in an acidic environment. So actually, the body is working with us with the saliva and remin when we have demineralized teeth. We just have to be able to see it better and work with it and we can do more good things. So it turns out we need a better concept because every, for every lesion we see in the upper right quadrant where structural changes are not reversible and we need to do restorative, Every one of those lesions started down here where we could do some other interventions. Every one of them. We just have to see them. We have to know that they'll progress if untreated. That's the deal. Caries is not binary. It's not as if I have a perfectly healthy mouth or I am treating a child under general anesthesia. There's a talk about backlog, you know, this closure for a couple of months amongst, amongst all the other problems financially and otherwise it creates for us, for our patients, you know, most centers have tremendous backlogs of restorative and especially the advanced restorative. And I don't know how we're going to deal with this. It's going to be a, really a big thing, but we want to start doing more prevention, at least for that reason. The patients think of caries as binary. You know, they come to us and we start counting the teeth during our recare visits. And, you know, we're doing the number three, two, three, four, five, going around the mouth. And they're wondering, why are you counting? Or I do ABCD for primary teeth. And then we're going to say, uh, well, uh, we're going to tell you how many cavities you have. And the patient or the caregiver thinks, oh, no, I had, you told me I have two cavities. Well, it's as if they didn't know, and then they don't until we tell them. He said, don't worry, I'll get you back in. I'll do a couple nice composites. You'll be fine. Send you out of here. You're good to go. But if they could see it, what if I had a little magic wand and I could wave that magic wand along like a little laser pointer? And I could wave it along all the surfaces of the teeth and I could actually see small caries lesions that, it, that we could never see with an x-ray or clinically right now. But the, with all the analytics we had, the device could tell me that if untreated, this lesion would progress into a cavitative lesion. Then if there were enough of them, they would say, well, this patient's really at high risk. Therefore, we can actually treat them as high risk, intervene, or maybe even treat the lesions at that small state in medic with medicinal therapeutics. 
So I'm giving you a flavor of it because there's so much to talk about. We all know about treating lesions in vitro. Um, Leon uh, Silverstone, years ago at the University of Iowa, showed us that you can remineralize any kind of caries lesion in vitro. Unfortunately, we can't section teeth and do that <laughs> in the mouth. So we got to be able to see these lesions that we can't see otherwise. We need a useful diagnostic that's sensitive and specific. And you're going to have a copy of this whole thing so you can look at it later. And I'm going to fly through this section just because, again, it's a, I want to only give you an overview today, but you're going to have all this material and you can go through it. And, and by the way, you know, um, I may not be able to immediately, but if anybody has any questions, I'm eager to answer them. Uh, you can email me and I'll, I'll give you my email at the end. Uh, I might not be able to answer immediately, but I'll try to get back to you soon with a, an answer to your question or guide you in the right direction. I just feel so passionate about medical management of caries, and I've been talking about this for years. And as I lecture about this now, you know, my most recent one before things started getting canceled was at the Yankee, you know, whereas 10 years ago, you only had a few people coming to hear this topic, and it was all restorative lectures I give, which I still do. Now they want to hear this. And I think that shift is going to continue occurring. You know, not that we're going to go away from restorative, but both are going to be important. There's a lot of technologies for risk assessment. And again, I'm just going to give you the overview today. I'm just going to highlight one in particular that's really exciting. Uh, many of them use chemical signature. They look for porphyrins that are sort of footprints left by the bacteria. So the bacteria that produce dental caries, they leave these chemical footprints called porphyrins. And you can shine them and they, they glow in the dark, you know, so to speak. They're fluorescent just like a fluorescent uh, you know, uh, light, uh, the same thing. So that's how many of them like the uh, laser fluorescence techniques work. There's a lot of data, hundreds of really good scientific articles showing that whereas, yeah, you can see a gray shadow here when it fluoresces, the computer can look at the porphyrins and measure the depth of the lesion, how much, by how much fluorescence there is. You can actually very well measure the lesion depth. You can also use uh, light with different frequencies just to do topography. I'm gonna to come back to this. There's a guy I met at the UW uh, eight years ago, an amazing guy named Eric Seibel. I'm still in touch with him. He's got a center for human photonics and he studies things with light. And um, he found out that he could just filter out a regular intraoral camera, like you'd see something like this, filter out all the frequencies except for 405 nanometers near ultraviolet, which is like your blue LEDs for your Blu-ray LED play player. Um, look at the difference in what you see visibly. And the, what the computer can see is even more dramatic, you know, in terms of analytics. So just by changing frequencies of light, and there's a lot more to that, that he's working on. There are other devices that use heat and the loss of heat. This is the Canary system. It's on the market. It's a bit expensive. Needs to get some outcomes data scientifically, but it's very interesting in the sense that it uses heat to go through a tooth. And as the heat loss as, as the ability of heat to progress in the way of infrared, I'm talking about microscopic pulses of infrared, you can actually see demineralized tooth structure depth. You can measure the depth of lesions. It's amazing what technologists can do. Um, there are a lot of other devices. This one was out 20 years ago. It doesn't look at small lesions, Diphody. There's a new version called Carry View. Some of you may have it from, from Dexas, from, uh, from uh, I don't even know what it is. It's, it's not still Danaher anymore. It's uh, Cave Ocur. Uh, is, the, is the, now the company. And this is the old version of it, but basically it just uses visible light, no x-rays. So I think we're gonna get to a world soon where you can actually, now with the carry view, shine light from the buckle and the lingual and look at the occlusal, like in this primary molar. And this is actually a proximal lesion. It's not occlusal lesion, it's a proximal lesion, very deep one. But you could even see small proximal lesions. Like here, we used Ifoti 15 years ago and we found that <clears throat> you know in a study we did, and the new ones are even better, that here you see a proximal lesion on this primary molar. I think you can still appreciate it online here. And this is not the same area, but you can also see, if you train yourself, proximal lesions on vis with visible light only. Okay, and that technology is going to improve and get really good as time goes on. I think we all know about Diagnodent. They sold 20,000 of these. They use fluorescence to measure depths of lesions. There are some issues, but this is an amazing product. Unfortunately, many dentists did what Diagnodent said. It said zero to 99. If it's over 30, uh, then you cut, you prepare the tooth. It basically was telling you to do restorative when there's a lot of false positives. So the problem is a lot of false positives. Well, it's, it's overly sensitive and not specific, like I was telling you. So, uh, but a good device. I don't want to bash the device because it has 
really good technology in it. And I think combined with other information, it's quite valuable. But I think a lot of these things are continuing to evolve. Uh, Denseply launched one called Midwest Carries ID. I think they eventually took it off the market because again, there wasn't good clinical outcomes data, but it uses LED light to look for breaks in the enamel rods. So it was actually, you know, if this were to have d data behind it, it would be amazing because it shows you according to it, you shine the light and if the tooth is decalcified, if it's, if it's healthy, it's green. If it's not healthy, it's red. Wow, that's a perfect world, isn't it? <laughs> tells you what to do. Unfortunately, the science isn't there yet to support it, but conceptually devices like this could assist us in making these decisions. They even said you could look at interproximal lesions through the breaks and the enamel rods. Other devices, there are like 25 of these kinds of devices that look for early carries in the market. I'm not gonna go into them obviously today. Here's one from Air Techniques, plug and play, plug it to your computer and it shows you the zones of demineralization using fluorescence. You know, I, I'm not going to say there's, again, there's not a lot of evidence on the outcome predictability that this is going to predict cavitation or something like that. However, it's great for patient education. It's great for looking at, you know, margins of uh, preventive resin restorations to see if they're leaking, things like that. So we're going to be using these caries detection tools for a lot of different things. QLF was the original one, as I mentioned, and it... Um, you know, it was bulky and expensive, 25 grand for one of these. They took it off the market. Nobody was going to buy it for 25 grand. Um, but as I get my data from the bottom of a Snapple cap, this one says in 1945 for 12 bucks, you could buy a ballpoint pen. In today's dollars, that's $100. And um, so I was thinking, what is an analogy in dentistry? Where I think a lot of you use pulse oximeters. We do a lot in pediatric dentistry for sedations or if you do GA use a pulse oximeter. What does a pulse oximeter do? It shines light in the nail bed and then it looks for the color of the blood, oxyhemoglobin. The more red it is, the more oxygen is on the hemoglobin molecules. Saturation would be 99. Some just go to 100, but really 99. And then you can see how saturated the blood is. So when these things first came out 35 years, 40 years ago, they were like $100,000. They were only in ORs for anesthesiologists. Now I found this guy on Amazon for $18.99. 19 bucks for a finger pulse ox. Now this one doesn't record and they could deliver it to me by the next day. Oh, look, I could get it today by whenever it was. We got the biggest warehouse for Amazon, even bigger than Seattle, right down here in, Arizona, in Phoenix. And I can get most things by 1 p.m. So I get a pulse ox by 1 p.m. if I ordered it, whatever it was in the morning when I looked it up for $19. But when you think about caries detection, what are we doing with caries detection? We're shining some source of energy, light, uh, heat, something, and we're going to look at something coming back and it's going to tell us the depth of the lesion. Maybe it's a numerical score. Maybe it's a graphical depiction. These are the ways people are looking at this. And then once we are able to see it and also assess the risk by the volume of those lesions in the mouth, we can start to treat it differently and we can do all those kinds of medical management. This is overkill on data, but just want to show you this has been around for a long time. Here's one that uses electrical conductance, the teeth that conduct electricity, all teeth conduct, everything conducts electricity. When you have caries lesions, they reduce their ability to conduct electricity. This was on the market for years. They didn't have the clinical outcome data, but it had great science in vitro. I suspect it'll get resurrected. It's called caries scan and it can predict which lesions will progress, which ones won't, and then you could treat them. So you could have a patient, they have early lesions, you find them before they could ever be seen on an X-ray. The device says, if you don't treat this, it's gonna cavitate in a year. So you treat it with some medicinal thing that maybe hasn't been invented yet. If I have a big company and I can invent drugs that the dentist would apply to treat caries, get compensated the same way you would for restorative, why would I make a product to treat caries if you can't see the lesion you're treating? right? So as soon as these devices are perfected, you can actually see all these lesions that if untreated would cavitate. Then there's this gigantic market for products that would treat those lesions. And they're available. They're just not out there for us yet. So an example is like resin infiltration, but you can't see that until you, you go on an x-ray. But if you see it, then you can treat it before it becomes cavitated. I think we're going to see a lot of products evolve when we start to see caries detection. Okay, we have a, a question. Uh, when do you think insurance uh, and the business side uh, of prevention will catch up with payment and codes, et cetera? Yeah. 
I wish I could tell you that. I, I want it to happen today. And I would fight tooth and nail to help make that happen. I, I think the COVID-19 event is going to be a catalyst toward that because, you know, we're going to want prevention more than ever. And we're going to want to be able to do these things. And, you know, if we can't do other things, at least at the moment, to be compensated for the time that we take to prevent disease, which is even more important for the patient. So I can't give you an exact answer, but I can tell you that the stars are aligned. I think all parties would like to see this happen. Um, the concern is, and this is what I want to get across, if, if we don't have a specific risk assessment tool, if it's too sensitive, and every patient has tons of lesions, they're all high risk, we don't want everybody putting in claims that 100% of my patients are high risk, I need to see them all six times a year, that's going to get a lot of no answers. But if we can fine tune the system so we can really tell who's at high risk, then how could we argue not to pay us for the time it takes to do that so we can prevent, does that make sense? So that's why this risk assessment, specific risk assessment, the specific detection of Gary's lesions is so important. When that happens, I predict it's gonna happen very quickly at the Berlin Wall, it's gonna come tumbling down. That's my opinion, because it must happen then. And so this is a, this is a picture of a, uh, some work I've been doing now remotely. It's not my work, I just kind of got lucky I sat next to a guy, the then president Emmert, who is now the president of the NCAA at the UW, uh, had a thing where he wanted people from different schools to get together, talk about their science. I was invited to go. I sat and talked about early childhood caries at the table with me was somebody from philosophy, from the School of Art. And this guy named Eric Seibel, who's a mechanical engineer, and I gave my one minute spiel and he goes, oh, they still have cavities. I said, no, yeah, they're, they're actually worse now than ever. He goes, well, I didn't know that. And he told me about his invention and his work. And I urge you to go look at this human photonics lab. He's invented this device called the scanning fiber endoscope. And basically he can make this fiber optic less than a millimeter in diameter. This one's bigger, it's about three millimeters. But he can make it a millimeter in diameter and the center of it is a single illumination fiber. Circumferentially he has collection fibers. And then it spins, this thing with the piezoelectric device spins inside so there's not too much heat at the end of this device there's an HD resolution camera at the end of this one millimeter fiber. And he's using it for endoscopy of the stomach, in this case, intraoral tissues, endoscopy of the stomach, and even looking at fallopian tubes, not invasively to look for the earliest seeds of ovarian cancer, which sometimes starts in fallopian tubes. Never been a non-invasive way of looking. So I said, hey, maybe you could try something for caries looking at approximately, looking at early lesions with fluorescence. So fast forward now, eight, nine years later, this is him, not me. I just happened to sit next to the guy and tell him I'm, I'm seeing this clinically. And he has now a million dollar grant for the National Science Foundation. He's got a couple PhD students. One's already done their PhD on this with Carries and his work. And he's got a guy working with him who used to design the cockpit displays of the 777 airplane at Boeing uh, in part because he's an expert on fluorescence. You know, those black screen cockpits where they work in part by fluorescence with the same porphyrin type chemicals that we look at for fluorescence for caries lesions. Who would have thought? Somebody designing a cockpit display for an airplane would understand bacteria and dental caries. So it's fascinating stuff. And Eric's now working on this and you can look that up and I'll report back to you all later about this. And he's done a bunch of work looking at different frequencies. He made this big clumsy device. He knows he's got to get it down to a little pen for a couple hundred bucks. He's got to get all that into this. He's working on it. And uh, we did an early study when I was up there, just a proof of principle. We separated the teeth with orthodontic separators. This is a big, thick one, about four or five millimeters. It's just proof of principle. And we did prove the principle that if we at least could see the later stage lesions on bite wings, we could actually see them uh, on the screen. And this thing could measure the depth. And it could distinguish between healthy and demineralized enamel. Pretty cool. So we proved that it could work in principle. And now he's continuing on this work and he's looking at acid detection with his device and all kinds of things. So I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. I think we all know about uh, the advanced stages of caries lesions and um, talk briefly about biofilms. In my calculation, I've got about 16 minutes left. So in case I don't uh, get everything in, you're gonna get the full presentation here and the last part of it, I'm at least gonna show you one case it deploys the principles of restorative and medical management of caries. I wanna show you one case. 
And then you can look at the other cases. This is the case I did with Simon Lin, which I think is still a great case to discuss it. So plaque biofilms, we all know what biofilms are. I learned from the master, Bill Costerton, who at the Montana State University, he passed away a couple of years ago, sadly. He taught me a lot of things when I was uh, working at Sonicare Toothbrush back then. And uh, we need to learn about biofilms. We talked about plaque, but I didn't know about biofilms. And we learn now that if you clean your teeth perfectly and the plaque starts to grow back, it grows in this sort of flat planktonic stage. And then it grows into these very specific shapes in the 400 or so plus species of bacteria in our mouths. Um, you know, I always tell people that I'm not really speaking to you right now. I'm a biofilm that's occupied a body that it needs to speak because the biofilm can't, doesn't have vocal cords. If I keep giving all these webinars, I won't have vocal cords either, but, uh, but biofilms don't. And each of us as humans has 10 times as many bacterial cells in or on us as we have human cells. We are mostly bacteria in terms of number of cells, but we have an interaction with the biofilm and a lot of it is symbiotic. Most of it is symbiotic. It's when it gets out of whack that there's a problem. We're only just learning about it. Some of the work of, that Bill started 20 something years ago and with Jeff McLean and the Perio department at the UW, he's in Perio, but he's a caries researcher. He's got some really big NIH grants looking at this are fascinating things. And it's all evolved in the last couple of years. And it's going to really lead the way towards making drugs, peptides, mouth rinses, treatments that the dentist will use in the office to treat these early caries lesions based on these only recently known discoveries because of the way science is growing. So we know that the biofilms make acid that goes out into these channels. We know they move along the surfaces of the tooth. Paul Studley, not at Ohio State, showed this a long time ago with Bill. These biofilms that make acid, they move. We don't know exactly why. Um, we also know they communicate with one another. In the body, we have a system where if you get excited and you want to, your body's going to release a, uh, epinephrine, adrenaline. It needs a signal from the pituitary gland to do that. So the signal, chemical signal goes through the body, through the bloodstream, tells the adrenal gland, make adrenaline. You make it. It works. The biofilm works the same way. It's not as simple that strep mutans or lactobacilli makes acid. Turns out there's a whole chemical communication system in here. So if we could dis disrupt that communication, we might be able to turn off acid production. Wouldn't that be cool? This is exactly how drugs are developed. Like Nexium. Nexium is a, is a human process of you know proton pump of making acid excessively and you can interfere with that process so why can't we interfere with the bacterial process of making acid so jeff this is his stuff um a genius at, at uh, carries microbiology calls it a polymicrobial disease and obviously you can't see this i'm just going to get the main points you can look over this later we know about the Stefan curve. If you give any kind of sugar, glucose, sucrose, sucrose is the best for bacteria. You get the pH drop, it gets below 5.5, and animal starts to demineralize, and then eventually it comes back up. But what Jeff has shown, and it's funny, whenever I have the dental students and I show this, I'll, I'll show this slide and say, okay, you got to write this down. It's going to be on the test. <laughs> and people scramble. That's all these different bacteria that is. Just kidding. Um, but here's a subset of it, and what, what Jeff has shown, and I, I've asked Jeff a few times that if what I'm saying is accurate, because I want to make sure I'm not watering it down too much. But essentially, some of the main takeaways are that as you see the pH drop when you give the sucrose or, or glucose, in this case, to the biofilm, it does start to come back up. But what Jeff's able to look at through his lab techniques is look at which of these bacteria, you know, the hundreds of species of bacteria is producing what, ask, I'm sorry, what proteins in the millisecond times after that sugar is given. And by doing the computer analytics that he does, he can actually see what protein product is required as a precursor to the next one. So you can kind of see the cascade of events. So in order to get this, you have to have this, which have this, but some, one of his interesting discoveries is this, for example, is this genus called Vilonella atypica. Now, this is one of the two thirds of the bacteria in our mouths that we never knew existed because we couldn't grow them in culture. They don't grow in culture. But now with RNA and DNA techniques, we can multiply them and see them. And it turns out that that Vilonella group comes in late in the game. And it appears to be related to turning off acid production. So what if instead of impairing mutants from making acid or other bacteria that do, you could actually turn on the good ones like Vilonella 
that would slow down acid production. So maybe there's another pathway. So this is all going to lead to the development of peptides, other drugs that could be used in mouth rinses or perhaps applied as a varnish in the dental office that would turn off the acid production in a biofilm in a very specific area, or maybe as a generic treatment of the mouth in an empirical way, and therefore reduce the risk at a local site or generally speaking for the mouth. So there's a lot of exciting things that are gonna evolve from, from this. So I gave you just a two minute description and I hope I didn't destroy too much, but uh, Jeff's great work, but there's so much good stuff coming out of there. It's gonna change. I, I think that this kind of biofilm work and carries is going to be a game changer for dentistry. It's going to evolve. It's going to evoke drugs. It's going to help us understand what we should be doing in our in our uh, recall visits and our more often visits for high risk patients and how we can get compensated for doing those things that impair cavity production. Right? We got to get to the bottom of that. So here's a kid that we. There's a product that I like to use called Placotect. You may not have heard of it. It's these individual. A uh, company's called Directa. They sell through dealers everywhere, the Swedish company. And they have these little sponges that are soaked with fluorescein dye. So unlike the red disclosing agent that gets all over your clothes, you take one of these and you rub it all over the teeth and it shows you fluorescence. Look at that. So the kids could say, well, I just forgot to brush today, but I brush every other day. Well, this is going to show you the stuff that's been there that's making acid around the gingival margin here and the places where, if you look where the Curie's lesions are, they're gonna be right where those places are. So there's a lot of good ways to kind of tie in the principles of Curie's management. Um, here's another one from GC, which shows different colors of plaque according to how old the plaque is. Um, but we have a lot of technologies like that. So I'm not gonna talk about silver diming too much, but just to say that it should be in everybody's office and I think, again, especially now, and of course, going forward in the next phases of care as we're treating caries lesions, um, for most of you who treat adults, that I don't, except to me, an adult is like 14. <laughs> um, I actually would be senior adult dentistry for me. <laughs> but if you're treating an adult patient for whom you've made a crown and it's the crown's getting older and maybe there's a defect in the margin and you don't wanna replace the crown, you wanna repair that defect, as an example, you could actually clean out that area, kill the biofilm that's causing the caries recurrent lesion there with in this case, silver nitrate, which has been used for over hundred years, including by GV Black, uh, which works. It halts, it halts, it stops, it kills biofilms. Or more appropriately, you could use silver diamine fluoride as we do in kids all the time. It works, it works the best for large cavitative lesions or lesions that you can get access to. So if you can get access to the lesion, it's better. And it will, if you see that fluid getting to the site of the lesion as you agitate it, you will kill the biofilm and you will stop the regression of the lesion. People ask why well, I need to treat it again. Is it going to work? It, you know, it's, it's like the analogy I often give, it's, it's like when you do dentin uh, treatment before a resin composite, you know, when you're doing bonding, you have to do the priming and the bonding in some form, acidic priming, bonding, either all in one or in two step, whatever you do, the, the process has to occur microscopically on the surface. But if you can't verify that the liquid got to the areas for the right amount of time that the manufacturer recommends, then it may not work the way they prescribed. Same thing here, you gotta get the liquid to the lesion. So that's why a large lesion is easier because you can see, you know the liquid's getting there. The smaller lesions where they have undermined enamel, maybe you're not getting that liquid to the depth. So sometimes you may even have to remove with a hand instruments, some of the underlying enamel, if you're not going to use a hand piece, just to get the liquid to the places it needs to go. You need to physically see it go to those areas. It imparts a hardening effect to the dentin, um, healthy dentin that's been etched, and then you apply silver diamine fluoride. It actually makes the dentin harder than healthy dentin. You know, healthy dentin, if you take a sharp explorer or a spoon excavator, you can scoop, you can scrape away healthy dentin, right? If you have a sharp instrument can't do it if you've treated it with silver diamine fluoride. It actually makes it harder. Procedure is to apply a drop, and this is just showing on a primary molar, 30 seconds, some say a minute. There aren't any pres prescribed protocols that are, that are set that can be stated as better than the other. You dry it off, you wash off the excess, and then you have a black stained area, but you've halted progression. This is a patient, and this is from the University of Hong Kong from a publication. They've done the most work on this. 
patient with salivary deprivation from uh, head and neck radiation from oral cancer um, from a tumor. Uh, it's great as an interim treatment before you do definitive restorative. It will halt even in the worst case scenario, patient who has no saliva production, it works to halt progression of lesion. So it should definitely work in other scenarios where we do have adequate saliva. First product on the market with this advantage to rest and they have a unit dose and a bottle dose. I'm a big fan of unit dose. I think by the way, one of the, you know, speaking of post COVID-19 things, I think it's gonna be a pretty big boom for our unit dose products, right? <laughs> Um, so if you have a choice, you're probably going to think more about unit dose, although I don't know what's going to live inside silver diamine fluoride. <laughs> Any case, um, this is just some of their product. I think, you know, again, for most of you treat adults, large cavitated lesions that you're going to build up or restore. I think in the near future, we're going to be treating them all because we're, you know, the, the evidence says do more indirect pulp caps. The way I trained 30 years ago was you just keep going to you strike oil, you know, if you, there's decay, you keep going. If you strike oil, you do a pulpotomy or a root canal, right? I think the evidence today is pretty clear that you try to avoid if there are no symptoms and you, you believe you have a healthy, you have a vital pulp, that you leave some of the decay and then you restore it. But if you're going to do that, why not treat it with silver diamine fluoride and then do your restoration either at that time or later, because then you've at least you've killed the biofilm remnants that are there. And I think it's going to become part of a normal care. Sorry about the blurry picture. Kids move. It does stain black. And, you know, um, yeah. In this picture, I love uh, at one of the alumni events we had uh, a couple of years ago at the UW. Chris Wagner, uh, he was the president of the class of, huh, it was either three years ago or four years ago, approximately. And uh, Donald Raleigh was the president and first in his class of the first class at UW, graduated in 1959. Um, in 1949, actually, 19, 19, I'm sorry, what does it say in his badge? 1950, that's what it is. 1950 was the first class, that's right. And of the UW, they started in 46. He actually uh, was in Pearl Harbor when it was attacked. And Donald Raleigh told me that they taught them silver nitrate treatment for caries back then in the first class of UW. And for somehow it kind of got dropped as a treatment. They used to treat their cavities with silver nitrate, like GV Black did. And then we started teaching with Chris Wagner's group, silver diamine fluoride, not silver nitrate, but the same principle, same silver treatment. And so it's made a comeback. You know, it's 150 years old, silver nitrate. And I think it's gonna make a bigger comeback along with many other agents. It's not alone, it's not the cure-all product but it's a, it's a great, uh, great asset to dentistry. And you can find all, we have a Facebook group, 5,000 pediatric dentists, and the number one posted thing is using silver diamine fluoride. Here's another product from SDI, another company from Australia. They've got a second product called potassium iodide, and you put that in and it, um, it's supposed to turn the color back to white. There's some discussion out there that maybe it prevents the effect of the silver diamine fluoride to be determined. Uh, but it's a nice capsule. I like that it's unit dose and it's got this little membrane. You pierce it and you, you can take off the excess just coming through that top, as you could imagine. So it's a bit more expensive, but, but these capsules are nice. So you can try them both and see what you think. I just use the silver part. I never really thought the potassium iodide was necessary because the black can be dealt with later on <laughs> by restorative or by removing it with a big round burr. Um, I actually found out there's a number 10 round burr. I never knew that in dental school. And a number 10 round burr is actually flatter than a number eight. Therefore, if you're going to remove this black later, you know, you could use a number 10 and then you're going to peel off the dust of black and then you can restore if you're worried about it shining through your, if you, you know, uh, if, you, if, you have some, if you don't have some kind of opaque or something like that, if you're going to restore it afterwards. Okay, let's uh, take just a couple of questions here. Yeah, because... and then I'm going to end it with a short case after the questions. Okay, so um, have you had any success for, with silver diamine for interproximal lesions, incipient decay? How do you get it interproximally? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of discussion about that. And I actually just uh, wrote a paper in uh, Inside Dentistry, I think. No, it was in Compendium last month on that. Um, you know, there's not a lot of evidence that you can get the silver particles. You know, they're, they're, big, they're big molecules. You know, and you can't get it to penetrate non-cavitated surfaces. 
However, there is some communication between the plaque biofilm on the surface, even if it's not cavitated, and the underlying lesion. So if you apply the silver diamine fluoride and, and this paper, and I can get the reference out there, I think it's in Compendium last month, Ted Kroll was the first author, and it shows using different kinds of brushes that are already on the market to, uh, to push the uh, silver diamine fluoride in approximately, leave it there for 30 seconds, then remove it, and then you can apply it to the surface. There's no evidence. You know, people are talking about it as if that works universally. You know, people talk about it in cases. I would imagine that it definitely doesn't do any harm, but that's why I said that the best case scenario is when you have access to the lesion when it's cavitated. There, you know that it works. There's strong evidence that it works. And I'm not saying it doesn't work in a non-cavitated proximal lesion, but you can't prove that it will. Okay. Uh, how long does it take for it to become black and harden the dentin? One week, minutes? Minutes to get, uh, seconds sometimes to get black. Um, in, terms of, um, in terms of getting hard, usually that happens right away too or shortly thereafter. It's kind of a complicated question and answer because it depends uh, how largely cavitated it is for the large cavitated lesions. When you apply it, it does take a few days for the, you know, the collagen matrix that's remnant there from that soft decayed stuff you left in there to um, dissolve from the silver diamine fluoride. And then a couple days later with a salivary wash, if you leave it open, which I do often before restoring, then it gets hard after that. Okay. Somebody asking if they could get uh, access to the biofilm research articles that you've uh spoken about. Do you have a... Uh, I'll send you a couple and Tim, maybe you and I can talk in the next day or so and then I can maybe put together some of those kind of things and send it to uh, the group or post it. I'll, I'll just put a couple key biofilm articles out there. Okay, terrific. Uh, what are your thoughts on ozone to arrest caries? Yeah, you know, there was a lot of work on that about what, 15 years ago. Most of it was done by one guy in the UK. And, um, you know, some good evidence around it, but I think here's the problem. It, there was not a lot of, there's good evidence that it killed a lesion. And most of that was done on Pitt and Fisher carries mostly. They had this little cone device, looked like the cone of silence. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it, you know, it caused that ozone to kill the biofilm on the surface. There wasn't a lot of evidence that when you finished it six months later, it didn't come back. And I think that there's no, there's not a lot of outcome data in the long term that it really helps. So what we're doing there is trying to apply a principle that ozone kills bacteria, which it does. There's no question. And then say, well, if I make this device and put a little chamber that I can kill the bacteria. It's, it, and also it's a very expensive way of doing it. There's a lot less expensive ways of dealing with it. But I think the data outcome data is just not there to justify it right now. Uh, you shared a lot of possible uh, future technologies uh, available for early caries uh, screening and products. What would you endorse today? It's hard to say that I would endorse one thing. Um, well, there actually, but there are two that have the best evidence, and that would be like the diagnodent. The problem with diagnodent, though, it's very sensitive, but it's not specific, and you're going to get a lot of false positives. So it's going to pick up things that are there, but it's sensitive to moisture and stain and things like that in the teeth. So the reality is there really isn't one thing that you can just pick it up and say, this is going to tell me if there's a caries lesion approximately or not, and it's going to see it. I think we're a year or two away. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually currently putting together an all day presentation just on that subject to, that, that kind of gives you uh, play by play for each of these devices, where they are, what the science is, when I think it's going to get there. I think that you know, if he gets the right funding, Eric Seibels, and I have no financial interest in any of them. I wish I did by the Eric's <laughs> uh, at the UW. It's, it's, a, it's a really good idea and he's a smart scientist. I find that it's always, not always, but usually you know, when we have a problem in dentistry, there's somebody out there in the rest of the world that doesn't know we have the problem, but they've got the solution mm -hmm. and they don't know we have a problem. And that's what happened when I sat next to, Jeff, sat next to Eric at lunch that day. He didn't know we had a problem. I didn't know he had the solution. <laughs> and he's going to figure it out. He just needs some more funding and some more time. But I think others will get there too. I think we're a couple, three years from getting that perfected probably, but we're getting there. Okay. What are your recommendations to treat high levels of strep mutans 
antimicrobial or pro probiotic options? You know, it's interesting. I've been reading a lot about probiotics lately, and I, I think we're just scratching the surface on probiotics. And it, it, when you think about how penetrated the market is with probiotics and gut biofilms, it's, it's highly endorsed by scientists and clinicians in the, in the GI community. But isn't the mouth part of the GI tract, mm -hmm. right? It's the beginning. <laughs> Everything enters the body that way. And, you know, so I think we're going to see a, 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 gr a real rapid growth of probiotics in dentistry, uh, both prescription and OTC, without getting into more detail. I've actually talked to some of the players there just recently about that. So that's an interesting subject. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of lecturers out there, like, you know, the pharmacists who talk to us, and they've been talking about this for years, but I think it's going to really hit dentistry in a good way. Okay. Can you repeat the two brands for caries detection, the one from GC America and the one from Placodent? Yeah, the GC one is called Two Tone, I believe, like two tones. Yeah. I can't remember. I think it's two T-U-T-O-N-E maybe, but I'm not sure. And the other one is called Placotect, P-L-A-C-O-Tect. I have to go back and look how it's spelled, Placotect. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see. What's your opinion on silver dimine fees to patients? You know, here's, here's my thing with silver dimine fees. I kind of put it like sealants. When sealants came out 40 years ago, the fee they set for them was too low. And the problem is, you know, now that insurance companies pay for it, you know, the reimbursement is low relative to the value. The value is very high for the patient. And they're not that simple. I sometimes say to do a stainless steel crown like I do, we don't, you know, it can be a little bloody and all that is harder, is easier to do than do a good sealant. We need isolation and all that. It's technique sensitive. Um, but with silver diamine fluoride, my concern is as third party payers start to pay for it, they're going to reimburse it too low of a rate and it's going to disincentivize doing the right thing. And so I think it's up to us together to collectively talk about the value of that procedure. And this is really a question for all of medical management of caries, because if we're doing a service for the patient, that's going to prevent a much larger expense later, then we should be properly compensated for the expertise to decide to do it, the ability to do it and to do something that's preventive in nature, as opposed to restorative in nature. It's a complex subject, but I'm praying that as the fees come out, they're not too low. Otherwise, we're almost better off having them not covered and doing it out of pocket and getting it that way, which is another discussion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've got a, a number of more questions here, but I know you have a case you're going to get to. Uh, yeah. As you go it through that case. take me two case, minutes to do the case. Okay. Uh, I, I can see from your slide set that it looks like it's uh, you're going to do a restoration after using silver diamine. No, uh, this, this is not a silver diamine. It's actually a glass ionomer. It's just uh, oh. Another principle. Okay. Uh -huh. okay, maybe we'll hit these questions in. So, um, does it, uh, applying silver diamine fluoride during deep caries excavation affect the bonding to the surface? That's a really good question. So, there's been a fair amount of studies on this. And because the, you saw that picture I showed before of the etched surface, the control, and then the silver diamine surface that showed all that silver residue. So as you would imagine, you know, bonding, the dentin bonding technique with resin adhesives requires a certain morphology to get the hybrid layer right and all that. You got to, you know, and I've seen, you've seen all the electron micrographs. I've hung out with the experts who show us all that. And um, so if you, if you do silver diamine fluoride treatment, it definitely could impair resin bonding. So if you're going to do resin bonding, you, you change the morphology and you're not going to get that intertubular dentin in the right form that you could actually bond properly and get the hybrid layer. So the advice is you could do one of two things. You wanna do a resonant uh, restoration. You can first apply a glass onomer, which is not affected by the morphology, which I think is like the sandwich technique, which I like anyway, and use that to replace all the dentin. You can go directly on it, but it does bond effectively to silver diamine treated surface. And then you could bond to that above on the, where the enamel would be, replace the enamel with composite. Okay. Uh, any contrary indications of using silver diamine fluoride or silver nitrate? You know, um, 
the, the manufacturer has on the label and it's off label use, which I didn't get into, but you're deciding to use it off label because it's only according to the FDA, like fluoride varnish indicated for dentin hypersensitivity treatment. That's a long story that would take way too long to explain right now. But um, I think you know, the code, the procedure code, if you look at the description of the code, the 1354 uh, medicinal treatment for caries, it actually, um, it talks about it being an asymptomatic lesion. And the reason it says asymptomatic is, you know, people have suggested that if you get this on the pulp, it's going to cause damage to the pulp. There's no really a lot of evidence. They used to put silver nitrate drops in every kid's eye born in America 30 years ago. All of everybody my age, when you were born, you had silver nitrate put in your eyes to prevent transmission of sexually transmitted diseases to the, to the, to the baby. So it's safe on the tissue, on the pulp tissue too. The problem is if, the, if you have symptoms, that suggests pulpitis, that you have a lesion that might be progressing in the pulp already before you do the treatment. So that's why it says asymptomatic. So the answer to the question, what would be the contraindication? Technically, it's a symptomatic tooth. You know, if this tooth is symptomatic to percussion or to cold or hot, and I'm not saying don't do it. I still think it could work. But you want to make sure that, you know, you're not uh, already needing some kind of pulp treatment anyway. And then if you do the pulp treatment, then you don't need to do the silver, the, the SDF, because you're taking out all the biofilm in the process. Um, do you need to scoop out all the soft carries first or just put on uh, the silver dimine after a good- That's a great uh, question. And I can't tell you this from the evidentiary standpoint, but I can tell you from my own experience. And here's my experience and what I do now. I've done a couple hundred of these even before this product was on the market. I was using the Australian one. They were sending it out. We were allowed to do it in the university through some studies. And same thing though, 38% silver diamine fluoride. Um, I, at first when I had it, and I was doing a lot of like primary first and second molars, you know, occlusal surfaces mainly that were deeply cavitated, big holes in the occlusal in these young kids. And I started out by taking, a, and these are kids who are pre-cooperative or they're like, you know, there's no way you can treat them. That's why we're doing the SDF. You get too hard to do restorative. So at first I would take a spoon excavator and just spoon out as much of the decay as I could. And then I would do the silver diamine fluoride. And then later I changed because I found out that if you do the SDF and you agitate it and leave that mushy dentin, that's what I call it, in there, as long as you can see it and you can see the liquids going to all the areas, rinse it and dry it. When you dry it, you've, you've, you've left the tooth, you've imparted an additional ongoing effect by allowing the silver diving floor to remain in that softened dentin, right? So it's like a reservoir, that collagen of the mushy dentin is retaining some of that SDF and you have a longer acting effect. Then I was having the patients come back a week later back then just to look at what's going on. And what I found was all that soft, mushy dentin would be gone. It would be like collagenase effect. It would all be gone and you'd be left with a very hard surface below that's like that glassy hard surface. So I actually think it's better to, uh, I'm not saying if you have like a large cavity and you, you shouldn't touch it, you know, you need to take out the bulk of it. But if you have, you're down to the place where you're doing an indirect pulp cap and you have a little bit left, you're probably better off leaving a little bit and then treating it because the whole idea of doing indirect pulp caps is a principle anyway, separately, if that makes sense. I can't give you an exact amount, you know, and it is different for primary teeth and permanent teeth too, by the way. You know, so I guess my take home message would be if you have a cooperative patient, an adult, which most of you do most of the time, I would treat it like you normally would an indirect pulp cap where you, you know, I mean, arguably every restorative lesion is an indirect pulp cap, right? Because <laughs> you're always leaving something in there. You just don't know it. <laughs> So do your restorative prep, whatever that is, whether it's an indirect pulp cap or just a cavity prep, and then you could do the SDF is just a, okay, now we're going to kill this, whatever's left, and then we're going to do the restoration. Okay. So uh, to clarify, are you doing the SDF, uh, SDF and waiting a period of time and having the patient back, or are you treating all the same day? You can do it all the same day. Originally, I was having them come back because, uh, well, there are a lot of cases in pediatric dentistry where you can't do the restorative. It's just too difficult from a management standpoint, behaviorally. But there's no reason why in most cases you, you, you clean it, you treat it, uh, you can do the restorative immediately. Yeah. Because yeah. it only and takes a minute or so for its effect, you know, to, 
again, like a lot of things, I can't give you an exact amount of time to wait at that visit. But if you, it's safe to say that if it's turned black and the dentin has gotten pretty hard with your touch with the Explorer, that you're probably safe to restore at that point. Okay. But again, there's no evidence to say that, you know, doing it this way versus that way. People haven't done all the studies like that yet. People make all these claims. That's why I tell you, from, I always like to talk from a conceptual frame of what makes sense. It doesn't mean that I've tested it scientifically. Okay. Um, how, how do you handle, you're doing uh, the silver diamine fluoride, you want to do the composite on top of it, uh, but it, you hit that with the, the curing light and everything just turns black as can be. Yeah, so a lot of people are doing that. They're using the curing light, you know, heat. That's they're talking. It's not the light that's doing anything. It's the heat from the light. Those LED lights get really hot at the end. So you know, heat speeds up any chemical reaction. So you're going to get a lot of uh, heat generated. It definitely speeds up the rate of it turning black because it is that chemical reaction. Some have suggested that well, I don't know. Maybe if it if it gets black too fast, the chemical reaction is so fast that it's not killing the biofilm as much. It hasn't been tested. So I think it's safe to say we don't know. Um, I can't give you an answer that that's better or worse or the same, but I know that people are doing it different ways. And it definitely does turn to black faster. So it might take 20 seconds instead of one minute. <laughs> okay. And let's see. I think that covers most of them. Oh, yeah, we keep getting more. I'll just... Uh, I think you've handled most of the questions here in some shape or form. Let's continue on. And uh, when we get to the end, we'll see if we have any more questions. Okay, I'll do a quick case here. Um, and I apologize for just talking too much and tried to get an eight hour lecture into an hour and 20, but I knew it wasn't gonna work, but here we go. Uh, glass atomers, one of my favorite materials. We'll talk about that another time. They're gonna make a big comeback they release fluoride. So here's a case, this is what I, I say this because it's great medical management. It's a little blurry probably on your screen, but this is number three. I'm actually right first, first permanent molar, tooth A, I'm actually right first, second primary molar. There's a lesion on the distal of A. We can see on this kind of fuzzy bite wing, okay? This tooth's gonna exfoliate in probably four or five, six months. So most cases I would say, the heck with it leave it alone. I'm not going to restore that. Even if it were all the way into Denton, I might not restore it at this stage. But why not think about this as a reservoir, place a glass onomer. There's already a filling here. Cut this out, place a big class two glass onomer here and let it pump fluoride into the mesial number three. Because if there's something going on in the distal of A that I can see, there's probably already something going on in the mesial number three and I can't see it. Now imagine the world of the future I describe when I have a curious detection tool. And I can actually see a lesion on number three. It's just starting on the mesial. But it's a watch, you know, it's too small. So what I can do, and this is the case that I did with uh, Dr. Lin did this at the UW. So here's the tooth from the occlusal, the old restorations here. Uh, and I'm just going to put it in this mode. So cutting a big, we want to make sure this tooth's going to fall out in a few months. So I cut a big swath to get the proximal. And actually you can see the, I can see the sort of white spot here. Couldn't see it on the radiograph. And then we're just gonna apply, we're gonna prime and bond it together. We're gonna apply a resin modified glass onomer that releases a ton of fluoride. Get it all in there, clean it up. And when we're all said and done, we're gonna have a reservoir that's gonna pump fluoride in for the next six, four to six months while this thing's here and it's gonna heal this. So in the near future, this kind of puts together what I was saying before, when I have those devices, I could shine my device here see a tiny lesion here, treat that lesion by putting a glass onomer here. Does that make sense? Treat that lesion by putting, and then I would like to be able to bill treatment of this tooth by putting a restoration in this tooth. Sounds crazy, but that's the concept of medical management, because that's your goal. So it's a whole change in the way we do things, but I like that case because I see a lot of those where you can do interesting things that would um, you know, help us all out um, yeah, I like to use these wedge. I don't know if you ever use these. They're called uh, Fender Mate or Fender Prime. Uh, for that same company that makes those little sponges I showed you. Directa, they make these little. Directa, yeah. 
they're, they're great for uh, class twos and primary teeth. They don't work as well as the fancy rings for uh, permanent teeth, but they work great for primary teeth. Okay, I'll end there and this, Jim, I'll ask you, Dr. Hess, if there are any. Okay, let's just see uh, some of the, these questions. What about using sodium hypochlorite in a product such as carry-free xylitol? Or yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of um, things out there already for mitigating risk. Um, the problem is because we don't have a good risk assessment tool that's reliable and specific, it's hard to know which of those work. You know what I mean? Like if my risk level is X and I could say that's really what it is, like take cholesterol. If my cholesterol, my, you know, my LDL was 140 and I wanted to get it down to 90, and I took drug X or did treatment Y, I could tell you if it, it was effective or not. But all those products you're talking about, there's no really good way to show that they're effective. It's theoretical. So I'm not saying they don't work, but until we have a good specific risk assessment tool, we don't know. And that's why it's so pivotal that we get those caries detection risk assessment tools right, because then we can have all these different agents and treatments, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, number of questions regarding uh, using the silver dimine on non-cavitated lesions. Yeah. I, I think uh, you stated before, we're not sure it's- Yeah, I mean, you know, you're applying it on the surface, it's not cavitated, but the lesions, you can see it in the radiograph, maybe proximal is the most common. You know, I'm not saying it doesn't work. We have no evidence that it does. There is some evidence in vitro. People say that it penetrates, but in vitro for that is not really as good as in vivo data. So I'm saying that it can't hurt. It does no harm, you know, to use a brush. And I even, you know, together with my buddy, Ted Kroll wrote a paper on this, but it was like a case report, you know, talking about that, yeah, this could work. This actually kills the biofilm on the surface and maybe it will progress, it will prevent progression. We just haven't done the outcome study. You got to do a study that shows that by doing that versus placebo, like brushing it without putting silver dimine, that those guys would progress and the ones with silver dimine would progress. Okay. Uh, how much fluoride is released from the class two restoration to the interproximal of number three? When you did? You know, a lot. Um, I didn't measure it there, but we know from many studies that you know, it's funny how the companies when glass armors first came out would compete and say, I released this much fluoride. And the other would say, oh, I released twice as much as theirs. or I released three times as much. Well, it's kind of like swimming in 10 feet of water, 15 or 20, it's still over your head. So, you know, you don't, you don't need that much fluoride, even one part per million, like in water fluoridation causes remineralization. So there's, let's just say there's an adequate amount for a, a significant period of time to allow remineralization to occur. Do you like bioactive materials such as Activa versus resin modified glass ionomer? Well, the key thing there is the word versus because Activa is a resin modified glass ionomer. And I think and Activa is a good product. It's, people like it because it behaves more like composite than other glass ionomers. But if you think about glass ionomers or resin modifieds, there are some kind of hybrid between glass ionomer and composite, right? kind of a mixture in various ways. The original ones were all very glass onomer like Activa is very composite-like. So that's why it behaves like composite, but it's going to have less glass onomer properties. And the word bioactive is, it's kind of a marketing term. You know, I mean, anybody, I mean, glass onomer is bioactive. It's actually the original bioactive material. So Activa put a stake in the ground on that. And I'm not saying it's not bioactive, but glass, but glass onomer is also bioactive. If that makes sense. So, okay. but, but, but Activa is a resin modified glass ionomer near, it's closer to the end of the spectrum of uh, composite than glass ionomer. Do you ever place fluoride varnish over the silver dimine fluoride to protect it from saliva? Does it matter? People, people do that a lot. I know several people have used silver nitrate for years and they apply a varnish. Um, I would say it doesn't matter you know, the evidence would say that it doesn't matter, but people did it with silver nitrate because there wasn't really a product. They felt like they were out in a limb doing it. There wasn't, you know, silver diving floor that everybody was doing and they didn't want to be risking all that silver potentially leaving out, leaching out into the mouth, although it wouldn't have been a problem. So they put fluoride varnish on, but it probably doesn't matter. 
Uh, I've heard the light curing makes silver diamine fluoride less effective. Is this the, the case? Well, that's the same discussion on the blackening thing. People have suggested that, yeah, it makes it black faster, but maybe it's too fast and less effective. Again, nobody can prove that. There hasn't been a good study. A lot of things are hard to study, so we just theorize. So my advice always is use the directions of the manufacturer because whatever they've come up with is the result of the formulation and methodology that they think works best. So as soon as you deviate from that, you can't guarantee you're going to get the results that they claim. Okay. Uh, related to non-cavitated lesions, could you use silver dimine fluoride as a preventative on hypomineralized permanent first molars? Um, you know, if they're hypo, I mean, it's, it, it's, Silver diamine fluoride treats biofilms. So it's not a remineralizing agent or something like that. So unless there is a caries lesion on them, you know, if they're just hypomineralized and maybe they're at risk, I don't, I mean, maybe I suppose it would have some effect, but if you apply silver diamine fluoride, it only turns black where there's a biofilm. So it's just not gonna do anything if there's no biofilm to treat, you know, caries producing biofilm, if that makes sense. Again, I don't think it would cause any harm. I just don't know if it's useful. Okay. How about treating lesions below the tissue with silver diamine fluoride? Any techniques? Yeah, if you can, again, it's about access. So I've started to use, even as a pediatric dentist, I've started to use retraction cord a lot more. And retraction cord is great. Like if you have a margin of a crown or something and you need to get it, just you know, anesthetize it, uh, put the retraction cord, get that gingiva down, and then you can see directly because it's really important that you're able to see where that liquid is going. And there's no harm if you warn the patient, if it gets on the tissue, it's going to maybe turn the gingiva white for a couple of days, maybe a mild um, sensitive burning perhaps sensation. But if it requires that to get the treatment, it's worth it rather than replacing the whole crown. Great for class five lesions that extend there on senior adults. Excellent treatment for that. I have this picture up just to try to impress Dr. Hess with my rubber dam here. I think Dr. Hess is saying that his computer just crashed. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we're kind of near the end anyway, aren't we? I think so. It looks like um, he's answered all the questions this far. Okay. Um, do I look at the chats and see myself or, oh, I can see them here. So this one question is interesting. I see here, it says, why not put SDF in number three while you have access? Not a bad idea. Um, you know, the silver diamine would have an immediate effect as opposed to fluoride, which is a slower effect. When I did that case, uh, it was before silver diamine fluoride. That's why I didn't do it. Superfloss has been used. There are many, in that paper that we did last month, we talk about all the different, I think it's in compendium, all the different treatments for uh, applying it approximately. Again, it's only a theory that it might work. There are docs out there that say never, dental caries never killed anyone. How can they say that? Well, that's not true, as you noted, um, sadly. Even one death from dental caries would be horrific, but it, the fact is it happens dozens of times every year in kids around the country that eventually get cellulitis. I think I've covered most. Um, that I can tell. And as I said, I'm available. I think I'm going to go to my slides here. Whoops. I'm going to back up. There's my email address. I can conclude with this. And that's what it looks like here, sort of, every day. <laughs> Do 
We have some great sunsets. Dr. Hess is back. Oh, um, hi, Dr. Hess. <laughs> Dr. Berg, there was a question from Sarah Park. She said I had a question in the Q&A. Okay, here. Oh, I had a question in the Q&A. This is the chat. That's not the Q&A. Dr. Hess, can you find the Q&A question from Sarah Park? And Dr. Hess is gone again, so let me help you here. Uh, or Sarah, could you do us a favor? Could you please retype your question again for us? We have several that have overrided yours. And she says she's retyping now. Is she doing it in the, in the chat area? Or is, where do I see it? Uh, let me just see. I've, I've got both up right now. Uh, what is the reason for why the prep on the last slide was so small, buckly, lingually for GI restorations? Do you need to open it up for cleanability? Cleansability, excuse me. Uh, you're talking about this one here, here? If you're talking about this one, that was actually a composite, not a uh, glass atomer. I was just showing the wedge device. So that wasn't, but you know, we just, we're just keeping it. I always keep them as small as I can and just to, um, you know, preserve tooth structure. And if anyone else has a question, if you could just please for simplicity, put it in the chat box right now for us. Um, Sarah's asking what about cleansability? Uh, regarding the smaller type restoration, I think. Yeah, I think that, you know, with primary teeth, um, we just want to make sure that it's sealed on the margin. And to me, it works better if we keep them small because the structure of the tooth is compromised. The tooth being so small, the bigger they get and the closer they get to needing a stainless steel crown. You don't have a lot of leeway from a small into a coronal restoration and a stainless steel crown. So I like to keep them pretty small if possible. And then uh, we've got another one. Dr. Hess is back. Um, for small decay, would you suggest we open the lesion a bit and then gain access to all decay and then apply SDF? You know, that's a judgment call. Um, if, you, if you don't have access to all the decay, then you definitely have to make it bigger. You definitely have to get your decay out regardless of what treatment you do. Uh, or if you're gonna leave some in, as I said, you have to make sure that the extent of the depth of the decay can be accessed by the liquid. And then what is the smart tech? I'm not sure what that is. They have it capitalized S-M-A-R-T and then tech. Oh, I see here. Oh. There's some, um, I think it's GC company that promotes uh, that they use the smart technique, which is a mixture of glass ionomer and SDF. It's the combination of using, um, you know, SDF subsequently restored with uh, a glass ionomer restoration. Okay, next one. Could you repeat how long silver takes to get black? It varies, but usually within a minute sometimes up to five minutes and on rare occasions, not for hours later, but usually within the first minute. Another one, uh, do you have to do several treatments of SDF on the same lesion or one treatment will stop the lesion? Um, you know, we didn't know that originally. And my experience is that if you have access to the lesion and you get the liquid to the depth of the lesion, one treatment will stop the lesion. It's all about getting access. Um, a friend of mine is, a friend of mine in IHS dentistry claims he had burns from vapors when using icon infiltration on white spot lesions. Are you familiar with the risk with this icon? Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with that. And, you know, we recommend that you don't get the material. I didn't talk about icon today. I didn't have time. However, 
Um, if you get the resin material or the etchant, which is hydrochloric acid, it could be caustic to the tissues. So that's why we recommend a carefully placed rubber dam for that technique. I wouldn't do it without a rubber dam. If you can't get a good rubber dam, I wouldn't do it. Uh, comment was, was just the vapors and on his eyes. Yeah, it's, you know, it's the hydrochloric acid part, but also the resin. But again, if you isolate properly, it's rarely a problem. I, I've done hundreds of those and not had a problem. Can, can you see the uh, chat uh, uh, window there, Dr. Berg? Is the chat you want me to look at or the... Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, would you use silver dimine fluoride and the Hall technique together? You know, people, people do that. The problem with that is if you're doing the Hall technique, you're probably not looking at a cap. You're not opening up the tooth. You're leaving decay and not prepping it. You're just placing a crown for those who aren't familiar with it. Uh, I don't do it as much as others, but I've done it. But if you do that, I guess there's no harm again in doing it, but you're not going to, you're going to have minimum impact of the SDF because you're not getting it to the depth of the lesion. Okay. Question chemically, what is the black byproduct from the SDF? Silver. It's oxidized silver. Okay. Um, I, earlier on, we had uh, somebody that was looking for a pediatric dentist down in the Tacoma area. Any recommendations? Of a what? I'm sorry. Of a, a pediatric dentist. Oh, in Tacoma. Um, I, there are several. I can do that offline if the person would email me. Perfect. Thank you. All righty. Um, we had a, a question um, about when you would be uh, going into this topic uh, uh, more expanded, uh, like half day or full day. Um, will you be covering this topic uh, in our master track presentation? Uh, well, I'm, I'm currently scheduled, I think, Dr. Hess, to do something for a full day in uh, next year, I believe, up in Seattle, right? Yes, you are. Uh, will you be including this in this that will lecture? be the main part of it in more detail. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions before uh, we uh, put up the uh, slideshow again with our upcoming webinars? Okay. I'm not seeing any. So, Dr. Berg, thank you very much for. Uh, donating your time. We've got a thanks and go Hawks and uh, we appreciate it. We may yeah. uh, tap into you again here. Uh, I'm happy to help and I'm honored to be asked and uh, everybody stay safe, stay well, and I look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon. All right. Thank you, Dr. Berg. If you'd stop sharing your screen, I'll share my screen and uh, we'll get those uh, other webinars up. There we go. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to log out and say thanks to everybody. Perfect, thank you. Okay, and here we go. And again, for those of you uh, that didn't catch this at the very beginning, we'd like to thank all our sponsors. You can see them up there on the slide, uh, our different dental societies, the University of Washington, Comet USA. Our CDA uh, verification will be emailed to each registered attendee after the presentation. This will be coming from the S School of Dentistry. AGD members, you do not need to submit your uh, CE uh, to the AGD, we'll do that for you. This process of getting the webinar uh, uh, translated into a YouTube uh, bit is going to take some time. Uh, if you need to contact us, here's a contact information, uh, www.washingtonagd.org or info at washingtonagd.org. On Friday, we're continuing the Omni Practice Group Leadership Through Crisis. We're going to be uh, doing human resources and your dental practice resources and talking about Delta Dental. 
Uh, next week, Dr. Lane Ochi, a beautiful lecture he did at the Academy of Operative Dentistry. Again, it'll be at 2.30 p.m. Tuesday, April 7th. This one is one you want to catch. Students, uh, young doctors, Saturday, August 15th, we've got a Crown Preparation 101 from analog to digital. Uh, that's either going to be at the UW or the WGG uh, Education Center. Uh, finally, Dr. Jason Kim will be giving us a lecture next Thursday, April 9th, utilizing digital photography to improve shade communication. So that's it for our uh, kickoff with our WAGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE. I'm going to let the slide deck go through a couple more times. You can use the QR, the QR codes there uh, with your camera to be able to um, pull up the registration for upcoming webinars. I'd like to thank uh, our executive director, uh, Valerie Bartoli, again, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Joel Berg, and the rest of the WAGD and all our support staff at the University of Washington School of Dentistry. Have yourself a good day and we'll see you Friday morning.